Thank you for viewing this recorded Reliable Automatic Sprinkler Company webinar. Should you have any questions regarding this presentation, please feel free to contact Reliable Technical Services at 800-557-2726 or email us at techserve at reliablesprinkler.com. For upcoming webcasts and an archive of past webcasts, please visit reliablesprinkler.com slash webcasts. Once again, Thank you and enjoy the presentation. Let's begin our presentation on automatic storage and retrieval systems. So rack storage, for some fire protection professionals, this is something you deal with every day. For others, it could be once a year. But no matter how often you work on a storage project, it can be one of the most challenging sprinkler systems that we have to design. To arrive at our design criteria, much information must be gathered in order to navigate the many chapters of storage that are found in NFPA 13. Some examples of the information that we're going to have to compile is the commodity classification, what is being stored, the storage method, how that commodity is being stored within the, the storage occupancy, the height, whether it's the ceiling height, the storage height, the clearance height, and how they all work together. Uh, the rack types, <clears throat> single row, double row, multiple row. What are aisle width considerations? And is the commodity going to be considered encapsulated? Those are all pieces of information that we can put together and, and probably do an estimation or a design of one of our systems pretty easily using NFPA 13. But what about those instances where we have a automated storage and retrieval system as the primary means of storage in an occupancy? And they can be many different styles, and we're going to talk about that today. But we have mini load sometimes that's out there. And this is where we store our commodities in small totes or trays in dense racks and utilize a automated stacker crane that picks these totes and containers and brings them to an operator. We could be looking at more traditional rack storage uh, that implements some roller technology or pallet shuttle robots. We could also be dealing with a whole vertically enclosed unit, something that uh, is standalone inside of a building that has different parts and commodities stored on trays inside of the unit and at a beck and call it's able to bring that product down to ground level and uh, have an operator be able to pull that stuff and one of the most unique things that you're probably going to learn about today is top loading uh, storage where we vertically store items and we use robots to retrieve them the thing about all four of these different types of automated storage and retrieval methods that we're looking at here is that we will not find criteria in any of the NFPA 13 documents that we work on today. And these are you know, mainly the law of the land, what has been the adopted code that we're supposed to be installing sprinklers under. When we come across this situation where we don't have criteria inside of the adopted standard and codes that we work under, we have, we have to find something. And what we can look towards is a lot of times factory mutuals loss prevention data sheets. Now as an insurer, factory mutual is incentivized to prevent fire and loss occurring in properties that they insure. And they do a lot of re research on their own and publish that research in data sheets. There's a specific data sheet known as 8-34 that is meant to talk about automated storage, automatic storage and retrieval systems. And the current edition that's out there right now was first put out in July 2017. And FM's been known to put out interim revisions over time rather than uh, calling it a, a, a new edition of the standard or the data sheet. So what we're going to talk about today is the interim revision is dated 2020. And inside of that, we're going to find all four of those types of automated storage retrieval systems that we just discussed. It's important to note that these types of storage retrieval systems, although they can hold all kinds of commodities and hazards, because we're just talking about 
a lot of times pallets and containers, the criteria that's set forth in Datasheet 8-34 is meant to only talk about class one through four in plastics as a commodity that's meant to be protected with the criteria we find today. Things that are specifically not addressed are going to be aerosols, ignitable liquids, flammable liquids, and other special hazards. Now, 8-34 has been around for several decades, um, but it's gotten a lot of attention lately because I think that we're at a point in, uh, in, in the maturity of technology and the need for greater efficiencies that we're seeing more of these automated storage and retrieval systems start to be implemented throughout the storage occupancies around the world. So in July 2017, the, the document got some attention with a complete rewrite. And we have one of the nice things about it is that they're moving towards in-rack automatic sprinkler protection schemes that are designed to prevent fire from growing vertically, which means that we don't have to worry about balancing the system that's in the racks with the systems that's the ceiling. Now, specifically dealing with the January 2020, uh, 2020 interim revision, each automatic storage and retrieval system got its own section. And as we go through all four of these today, you're going to see they're vastly different. So it just makes sense that we're going to have their own section. It makes this more of a data sheet within a bigger data sheet. So all four of these types are small data sheets inside of a much larger data sheet. But then also there was a new section that was added. And it was those top loading automatic storage and retrieval system we discussed earlier. And the criteria is based around solid wall containers and it was created from full scale fire testing at FM's facility. Now, for those of you who are not aware, these top loading systems that are out there, uh, there was a fire that occurred on February 5th, 2019. It's referred to as the Ocado fire. Ocado is the company that owned the facility. It's an online grocer that is able to use that top loading technology to pick grocery orders. And it was located in Andover, Hampshire in the United Kingdom, which is southwest of London. Now, ignition of the fire occurred at 1.41 a.m. And that was due to arcing uh, at, the at the charging station for the robots. The robots in incorporated a plastic top that through process of arcing ignited and it's basically believed that uh, the robot was sent on to the floor after charging while it was ignited. Uh, air sampling, fire detection was provided throughout the entire storage facility. So a very good detection, um, detection system was implemented at this facility, but for some reason it failed to detect fire. The fire was finally visually detected by closed circuit television at 2.15 a.m. And for some reason, fire and rescue was not notified at this point. I don't know if they had a, a just a control room that, that was tasked with doing that and they chose not to, but it did not occur. The engineers attempted to deal with the fire themselves. Sprinklers activated at 2.26 a.m. And uh, although that is 45 minutes after ignition, one of the things that we need to realize is that with the robot, being uh, in movement at the time, we never had a fire that was really stationary, generating heat and able to activate a sprinkler head. More than likely at this point, we have this, the, the robot stopping, the fire is able to generate enough, uh, enough of the uh, heat to activate our sprinkler heads at 226. Inexplicably, the Okado staff turned the sprinklers off. Whether they thought this fire was controlled, contained, or out, or whether they were trying to save some of the, the grocery produce, it's not clear. But turning the sprinklers off before the fire is extinguished is not the best thing. So five minutes later, they decided that they should turn them back on. And it was not until an hour after ignition that fire and rescue was finally notified. Now, that notification means they got a roll. And it's the middle of the night, so it's going to take some time to get up, get in the truck, get on over to the facility. We've given the fire an hour head start at that point from ignition to the time the fire rescue was notified. And what resulted was 
four days and the efforts of 300 firefighters later, a state-of-the-art 240,000 square foot automated storage facility was completely destroyed and lost to fire. So with that in mind, these top loading type um, facilities, they really need to be looked at and protected. And having this document put forth by FM is valuable in that sense. I think a safe figure on the number of these types of facilities around the world is probably still under 600 globally. So we're probably going to see a proliferation over time where more and more of these types of facilities are adopted. And what's also a little bit um, unfortunate is that FM was involved with the specification of the protection criteria at this facility. And because we didn't have proper fire and rescue notification at the time and proper detection and the sprinklers weren't allowed to stay on and do their job, we just don't know if what was there was going to be sufficient. Moving on, the first type of ASRS storage we're going to discuss in detail today is the mini load. This is our commodities that are stored in small containers in specialized racks. We're going to retrieve those containers using the stacker crane, which uses rail system to go up and down the aisles. As we mentioned, the material handling method is going to be trays or small totes and containers. We have a little bit of differentiation from traditional rack storage, and that's mainly because you'll see from the, the view that this picture is showing you, we're in the, the longitudinal flu space, these containers are actually going to rest on angle iron that's perpendicular to the loading aisle. The challenge that this provides is that when a sprinkler head activates, any kind of water is going to be landing on that angle iron, and instead of going down into the transverse flue or back into the longitudinal flue, it's going to be funneled in between the container out to the loading aisle. So we're just not going to get the water delivery that we expect throughout this array. Now, the rack dimensions are also going to be horizontally spaced, typically between 18 to 24. Of course, it can be shorter, it can be also longer. And our rack uprights are typically just a two by three metal arrangement. And our tier heights are going to be approximately one foot. In order to apply FM data sheet 8-34 for this type of storage, we're going to need to identify 10 pieces of information. First is the maximum quality hazard for obvious reasons. We want to make sure that we're protecting the right thing. Depth of the ARS unit row depth is going to indicate how many lines of sprinklers we're going to need to install inside of that array of storage. The material composition of the tray and container is going to be important as well. There's many different styles of uh, material composition that can be used for these types of handling and storage. Types of containers, just the shape of the container, transverse flue space width, horizontal distance between the transverse flue spaces, longitudinal flue space width, if one's provided, a longitudinal flue does not have to exist in this type of storage. Tier height, maximum storage height, and the maximum ceiling height over the storage area. So that's 10 different pieces of information that are going to be needed in order to apply this document correctly. Trays are basically flat tray elements. And what really defines it as a tray is that it can have a perimeter that goes up vertically more than one inch. If we go over one inch, we're in container world now. So that's what we're looking at. These, contain, these trays are actually able to be made out of four different material compositions according to FM, non-combustible, cellulosic, unexpanded plastic, and expanded plastic. Now, what we're looking at in this photo here is just an example of a mini load system that has a, a storage arrangement with carton commodity, so it's a, it's a cardboard box that's sitting on top of an unexpanded plastic tray. The type of container that uh, we use is going to be classified in five different ways. Open top and closed top are pretty obvious. But once we get into these next three, the vented, the solid wall, the mesh, things get a little bit complicated. So we need to look at what FM defines that as. With a vented container, we're looking at a container that's going to be able to release water into the transverse flue in a timely fashion. Uh, and, and an example of this would be that there's 30% venting within the 
bottom half inch vertically of the container. So it can't be 30% open at the top of the sidewalls. It's gonna have to be more down low. That way it can easily quickly get the water into the transverse flue space. The solid walls is any container that doesn't meet that criteria we just talked about. Um, so it's gonna be you know basically solid wall or just make sure that the venting is, is not in the bottom 30%. And then mesh is a non-combustible style container that incorporates a 30% opening in the bottom of it or a side, and uh, it's just really can allow water to, to penetrate through it. And again, those materials of construction can be non-combustible, cellulosic, unexpanded plastic, and expanded plastic. This document is gonna tell us when we need in-rack sprinklers. And the easiest way to determine that is to review the decision tree provided in figure five. It's gonna ask you a series of yes, no questions. And in the process of answering it, you're going to get a yes or no answer on whether or not you need to put ceiling sprinklers or ceiling and in rack sprinklers. The long and short of it is that if you have storage height that's over 15 foot, you are going to need in rack sprinklers every time. There is one path of the decision tree that says that if your storage is greater than 10 foot, you do not have to have in-rack sprinklers uh, when using non-combustible solid wall containers or when not using it. So basically 15 foot all the time and then over 10 foot, we have to be very careful to make sure that we're using the right type of container to be able to go up to that 15 foot level. With our ceiling level protection, we have three system options that FM provides guidance on. We can use wet, we can use a single interlock pre-action system, and we can also use antifreeze for this application. If we choose to use single interlock pre-action system, we're gonna have to install it as the equivalent of a wet system. And that's gonna mean that we need to look at the detection requirements found in FM data sheet 5-48, and it's gonna basically try and make sure our spacing is reduced and tightly spaced detectors so it activates just like a real sprinkler system would in that instance. For the antifreeze, we're gonna use 30% propylene glycol. And although that type of solution can possibly get you down to a 11 degree Fahrenheit occupancy, FM is gonna insist that it's only used in areas that are 25 degrees or greater. For those of you who have worked with FM data sheets in the past, these tables should be very, uh, very familiar to you. Those ceiling level sprinklers are gonna be calculated following one of these tables, picking the K factor, the storage height, the ceiling height, and then identifying the number of sprinklers and at what PSI. When we're doing sprinklers in the racks, we only have wet system options available to us to protect that in rack arrangement. So our traditional wet, and if we do have a concern about freezing, we can use that propylene glycol, again, down to 25 degrees or greater. As for the layout of these sprinklers, we need to look at several figures. The first one we're gonna look at is the worst case scenario, and that's where we're putting sprinklers in every flue space. And that's gonna be required when three conditions are, are present, not all of them, but just any one of them. First is the presence of a cellulosic open top container. So cardboard boxes with an open top, if they're part of this, sprinklers in every flue. Expanded plastic trays or containers. So the container itself being made out of an expanded plastic material, high hazard for the fire, that's gonna require sprinklers in every flue. And then lastly, we have a mix of what's being stored and then how it's being stored. Uncartoned, expanded plastic commodities maintained on trays, in vented containers, or in combustible, solid-walled, open-top containers. So you get any one of those three, we're putting sprinklers in every single flue space. If the horizontal distance is less than 12 inches, we get the option to skip to every other flue space. So we'll get some savings in sprinkler heads that way. The horizontal distance exceeds four foot, we end up installing sprinklers in every flue space, and then we have to put sprinklers in between the transverse flue spaces. If one of those three conditions is not present, we now get the option to skip every other flue space. And this is just a way to save 
uh, sprinklers inside of the rack. And that's going to be dependent upon if that transfer flue spacing uh, with skip sprinklers doesn't exceed four foot. So we're looking at the containers need to be a maximum of about two foot uh, in between there. Installing sprinklers uh, in the rack arrangement is going to require us to be more towards the face of the in rack. Uh, we're going to need to space that line of sprinklers 10 to 18 inches away from the space, from the face. For our mini load systems that have a lot of depth to them, uh, basically exceeding three feet, we're going to have to start adding additional rows of sprinkler heads. And in this instance, we're going to add the sprinklers and they can be spaced no greater than six foot apart in that transverse flue space. Now, if we have transverse flue spaces that we can skip based upon not having those three conditions for the way that the, the commodity is stored, we have the option to skip the flue as we know, uh, but spacing is still maintained at six foot in that transverse flue. That flue space that we skipped previously, though, now has sprinklers, and those sprinklers need to be installed on a stagger. A longitudinal flue space can be present in this type of storage arrangement. Doesn't have to be, but it can be. If a longitudinal flue space that's less than two foot is present, we need to put sprinklers in that flue space. Those sprinklers are going to be installed on a maximum of two foot center. Doesn't matter how the commodities uh, arranged inside of this mini load system, you're just doing all the longitudinal flue space sprinklers maximum of two foot away. If that longitudinal flue space is greater than two foot, that now is being considered an aisle. And when we're dealing with aisles, we do not protect within rack sprinklers. It's gonna allow the sprinklers at the roof to handle uh, the ceiling to end up handling protection of that space. So that basically is how we lay our sprinklers out horizontally within the racks. The next question we need to figure out is what's the vertical distance between in rack sprinklers depending upon how high this storage arrangement is. The easy answer is that it's going to be 10 foot maximum vertical distance between our lines of sprinkler heads. With an exception, we have the ability to go to 15 foot. We need to refer to table five and table five is gonna take a close look at the material handling, the composition of the material handling, what the container arrangement and commodity is like. But if all those conditions match up, we're gonna have the opportunity to go to 15 foot spacing, vertical distance for our in rack sprinklers. Once we get above those in rack sprinklers, the maximum storage height is going to be 10 foot to the ceiling level sprinklers above. What type of in-rack sprinklers are going to be required? FM requires the installation of quick response, minimum 11.2 K factor FM approved storage sprinklers for this application. They're also going to impose a requirement to maintain a minimum of four inch clearance between the top of storage and the in-rack sprinkler deflectors. If you haven't been able to, to, to tell by what we've talked about. Uh, this is a very dense storage method. Uh, there's not much room above the container to the next tier height. So for that reason, an upright just makes the most amount of sense because the sprinkler itself below the deflector, the piping under that is all going to fit inside of that four inch minimum clearance. Now what we're seeing as the best option for this is our GL112, 11.2 K factor quick response FM storage sprinkler. And what you see here is its install, its ability to be purchased with a factory sealed and installed, which is good to end up keeping water from getting onto these types of sprinklers and potentially preventing operation in a fire event. Now that we know about how to lay them out horizontally, how to lay them out vertically, we now need to focus on how do we calculate these types of systems. And it first starts with identifying the depth of the row. Once we identify the depth of the row, we now have the ability to look at the container material, the distance, and then get our number of sprinklers that's in the design. 
And for those of you that were wondering when all 10 of those pieces of information actually are needed for design, we finally see a reference to vertical distance between the tier levels. And we'll see here that anything greater than nine gets the lowest flow rate in gallons per minute. If we exceed nine inches, or if we go lower than nine inches, we need to increase the flow rate out of these sprinkler heads. So how do we do a calculation here? We have our uh, up to three foot depth of row. We're gonna need a single line of sprinkler heads. Once we get beyond three foot, we're gonna start putting additional lines into this rack arrangement. We have two lines, they're gonna be part of the calculation. We'll take the number from that table, divide it in half. If it ends up being an odd number, the odd number gets placed at the face, and then our even number gets placed uh, on the next line behind it. For any instance where sprinklers are located two feet or closer, uh, we're gonna end up having the ability to skip the sprinklers for the purpose of the calculation. So in this picture here, we see the longitudinal flu always spaced at two foot max. We're skipping those sprinklers. And the face sprinklers are skipping transverse flues. So we know that we don't have one of those three conditions uh, previously that, that was forcing us into putting sprinklers in every transverse flue. With our ceiling sprinklers, uh, we will need to calculate those in addition to the in-rack sprinklers. We have tables seven and eight. They're gonna provide guidance on how to do that. Next, we're gonna talk about section 2.2 of FM 8-34. This one deals specifically with rack structure ASRS. This picture here shows palletized storage on racks but our attention can't help but be pushed right towards this yellow robotic device that's front and center. And that's really what differentiates this right here. With this type of storage arrangement, it looks a lot like rack storage, the materials handled on pallets. We have rack uprights that are gonna be spaced predominantly for one pallet load. Uh, traditional racks end up holding two pallets, most likely. Um, the pallets are supported on horizontal supports that are going to run perpendicular from the loading aisle to the back. Uh, traditional rack arrangements run parallel to the loading aisle. We're able to rest pallets on top of it. These horizontal supports that run perpendicular to loading aisle allow us to incorporate two things. Number one is uh, the pallet shuttle robot technology, which is the yellow robot we see here. And then the other one is rollers or conveyors, and that creates a, a pallet flow rack, like a, a low-tech version of this ASRS type system. And then the unique thing about this is that we just don't get longitudinal flu spaces. These pallets are oftentimes butted right up against each other, and we lose that, that, that capability to have flu space. A little bit more about this pallet shuttle uh, robot technology. It's, it's a, essentially a battery-operated fork truck that runs on rails inside of the, the rack. Uh, it's a really good system for you know moving pallets front and back um, that, that normally we can't reach. We mentioned before the rollers. Rollers is the low tech version of this. If we install our racks with a slope and we have the ability to load on one end and retrieve on the other, uh, we can load pallets as you see on the left and they will roll towards the right. And then you always have a pallet in the loading aisle ready to go. It'll also be the oldest pallet, which is good for certain types of retrieval or certain types of inventory handling that's known as FIFO, first in, first out. As we look at both traditional pallet storage, which is pictured on the right-hand side of this picture, and uh, the rack structure ASRS on the left, they exist in the same warehouse space. We're just seeing a lot of similarities. The rack structure arrangement uh, will provide significant depth that goes beyond the requirements of ceiling level protection schemes for multiple row racks. And, and those deep rack structure automated storage retrieval arrangements that exceed 16 foot will require in-rack sprinklers. The in-rack sprinkler, uh, the, the similarities to rack storage really have made FM realize that uh, section 2.2 doesn't need to exist in FM 8-34. It's, it's more than, it's gonna be removed from one of the upcoming interim revisions or, or the next revision. 
for that reason, we're not going to really dive into the sprinkler requirements that are found in today's FM 8-34 with the January interim release. I wanted to take a moment before we tackle the last two topics today to remind you to register your email and contact information with us in the Q&A section. By providing this, it will ensure that you have that we have your contact information so we can provide you a certificate of attendance. If you do not wish to receive a certificate, you're, you don't need to provide us contact information if you don't want to. Section 2.3 pertains to a storage solution that is comprised of self-contained ASRS storage units that are vertically enclosed. The protection schemes that are discussed in the following slides are, are meant only to provide protection within the unit itself. These systems are enclosed units. They come as a package meant to handle material on vertical or on trays. Those trays are supported on a rack. It's important that those trays are vented and gridded because any type of sprinkler flow that occurs inside of this cabinet, we want to give the best shot for that water to trickle down to the bottom of the cabinet where maybe the fire is occurring. The retrieval method is based on two different types of units. The first one is a vertical lift. That's the one that's pictured on the left here. This is where we have trays that are retrieved by a, a, a picker, a robotic picker that goes up and down in the cabinet. It pulls the trays out of the rack and then delivers them down to the operator station at ground level. It's also possible to have what's known as a vertical carousel. These trays exist on a carousel and the whole entire thing must rotate around. And that's what you see there on the right. Protection method for this has been uh, prescribed as automatic sprinklers. If you have high value or the, the fire occurring in one of these units could cause a major business interruption. FM would like to see in addition to that total flooding gaseous agent. So we put sprinklers in there and then in addition to that, we're getting the total flooding of a gaseous agent to prevent against a major loss. We have five different types of systems that we're able to utilize in, inside of one of these cabinets. We have our wet system, we have a dry system, pre-action singular lock, again installed to be the equivalent of a wet pipe system, deluge systems, and then lastly, antifreeze using that 30% propylene glycol, and that's for areas that are going to be maintained at 25 degrees or above. Now, these two options that are new to us here, the dry and deluge, they do have a, a specific requirement, and that's that we anticipate a 40 second maximum water delivery time based upon four remote sprinkler heads. So that's what we need to be concerned about if we go with those two options. Make sure the water delivery is timely. That way we can end up controlling and containing that fire. If we take a look inside of the unit, our sprinkler requirements are going to be based upon a closed top unit. And that is going to need a minimum of an 11.2 K factor quick response standard coverage sprinkler head. What's unique about the application of this sprinkler in one of these cabinets is that we don't get to utilize the full coverage area of this product. You'll see here our sprinkler spacing is now a maximum of eight foot in one direction for a total of 64 feet. We need to calculate all the sprinklers that are going to be found in the unit with a minimum flow rate of 30 gallons a minute. The best solution for this would be our GL, GL112. This is a Dependent version of the product because we're probably going to be having piping outside the cabinet and we're piping downward. So we picked a dependent product for that. Now that's in a, a closed top unit. Um, FM does provide guidance for what's known as open top units. I, I honestly don't know if this is a thing. Uh, it's hard to tell from looking and talking to manufacturers of these units if they have any open top option. But if an open top exists, we have the same thing, 11.2 K factor, quick response standard coverage sprinkler selection. But what's radically different 
is a four foot maximum spacing. And that's in both directions for a total of 16 square foot. So we're really condensing things down. We're making sure that we have a lot more sprinklers over top of this unit, tightly spaced, uh, and, and maybe potentially activating and, and dumping a lot of water into that cabinet. Again, a minimal flow rate of 30 units or 30 gallons per minute in that unit. Now, this is all 25 foot tall units. Units can go higher than 25 foot. For that, we have some guidance on how to protect. Again, a closed top unit. Now is gonna require a K14 minimum storage sprinkler, quick response. So one of our ESFR pendant JL14 products would work out well for this. And the sprinkler spacing requirements are gonna be again, eight foot. So we're compressing it a little bit from when we use this at a, a, a ceiling level sprinkler system and calculate all of the, the sprinklers in the units. And just like before, we have um, the open top unit requirements as well. Again, forcing us to use a minimum of K14 when we exceed 25 feet. And our spacing has again been reduced down to four foot. Now, the question is, how many sprinklers do you actually need in one of these units? And that's a moving target because the unit itself has different sizes. Uh, on the small end, we could see a width of five foot, and on a high end, we could see the depth of it be eight foot. So that that's small. We could potentially do a single sprinkler in that unit should we be able to position it just perfectly in the center of the unit. Um, I think a lot of times that's probably not realistic due to the movement of materials inside of there and everything. We could probably end up looking at a standard answer for this of about four sprinklers per each one of these units. And when we look at the maximum dimensions, some, some of the maximum dimensions that are out there is in excess of 14 foot width and 14 foot depth. So we're definitely going to get up to uh, the need for at least four sprinklers as a minimum in those types of units if we can space it correctly. Now, what's unique about this over 25 foot tall type arrangement is we don't get a prescribed flow rate like we did before. We now see that we need to look at Table 15 for how to calculate. Table 15 indicates those types of protection criteria for K14 all the way up to K28 storage sprinklers that are pendants. And we remember that we've started out by talking about the model GL112, which is our 11.2 K factor product. And we needed 30 gallons a minute to uh, protect one of those cabinets. The unique thing about this table, though, is that we now have a requirement expressed in PSI per sprinkler. Rate. We need to look at how that translates to one of our GL112s. We were using 7.2 PSI to provide that 30 gallons per minute. And now we start taking a look at these numbers up in this table. We see they're much larger than seven. We start out on the left, they're, they're 50 to 75. And then uh, as we go more to the right, those numbers get smaller, but they never get down to 7.2 PSI. Well, we know the GL-102 is a 30 gallon per minute product at 7.2 PSI. We know that the pressures are more with table 15, but we don't know what that gallons per minute is. So we need to do some math to understand the severity of the disparity. And we take a look at this and we'll see that at a minimum, we're about 70 gallons a minute more per sprinkler. Uh, so it's not just the amount of pressure that's required, it's also going to be a significant amount more amount of water that's needed to come out of these systems. Fortunately, we have an alternative for over 25 foot tall units. It's going back to what we started with, which is using our 11.2 K factor storage sprinkler. That's quick response and standard coverage. And we get the eight foot maximum spacing requirement and uh, back to the minimum flow rate of 30 gallons a minute. But in order to utilize this type of sprinkler at the top, we're going to have to supplement it with intermediate level sprinklers that are installed at both ends of the ASRS unit. And that's going to be at least a K8 minimum non storage sidewall or extended coverage sidewall. And we're going to space that vertically at a maximum of 10 foot and you know, no more than 15 foot of storage can be above those intermediate sprinklers. And calculating all those sprinklers is going to require at least 30 gallons a minute inside the unit. Something to consider for this type of application from us would be our MBEC. It's an FM improved extended coverage sprinkler. 
just want to give you guys a sense of what these units are like a little bit. Here we see a bunch of side-by-side -side units where we have a person that's able to pick from trays that are brought down to his level. Uh, it's a pretty significant depth just for that tray. We know that we're going to need at least three times that tray dimension there just to, to understand how deep this cabinet goes. One to, to present it, the next to put it on the robotic picker, and then the ability to store it on the opposite side so they can get quite deep. And we mentioned that they do go over 25 feet. And here we see one of the more tall units. This is a installation of six units that are 40 foot tall at a manufacturer of you know, industrial trucks. Um, so this is how they choose to store their small parts. What's interesting, and it's unclear to me uh, how this works out in the real world, and if anybody has any guidance, you can uh, put some comments to us in the, the chat. Um, this document says that you shall you know, calculate all the sprinklers in the units. And when we look at these units that are put together side by side like this, there's really no uh, differentiation. There's no walls anymore. So this, this is, in essence, I think an all open unit inside of there. And does that mean you calculate all three of one of these units sprinkler heads? Don't really know. Uh, it's one of those things that, that the, the data sheet is a little bit vague on. And uh, that means that the FM uh, FM reviewer or the HJ, they can they can probably latch on to that that ambiguity and then you know force you to end up calculating more sprinklers than you had possibly anticipated in this type of arrangement. As we bring this presentation to a close, I think we save the most interesting storage range to discuss for last, which is the top loading. Uh, it's such a unique concept. I think the best way to try and provide this, uh, provide context for this is to just show you a video. So we end up having storage on rack that we typically see. If we take that storage and we put it into containers, we stack those containers vertically, we build a grid around it, place robots on top of it, we can now really efficiently use that space. And what we get is something like the auto store. Robots running around, picking these containers, uh, delivering them back to our human operators that are going to pick those products out of the containers and then package them up and ship them. Um, this type of system has about 20 foot of storage. And what's unique is that these containers are going to have to be picked and if you got something on the bottom the robots going to pick and move and pick and move and pick and dig it out but what happens is naturally over time your slow moving objects go to the bottom of the storage arrangement and your high volume movers stay at the top so it's not that inefficient for robots to work in this way the other unique thing about this is that we can build a very interesting geometry to the storage arrangement to fit any kind of building it can be wrapped around columns. It can go on weird sloped walls. It could even traverse into other buildings if we provide a pathway for the robots to cross. So it really can truly maximize your spacing. Now, the materials are held in containers that are solid walls, and they're most commonly open top constructed with uh, of unexpanded plastic. The retrieval method is, you know, just stacking them and then having the robots run around on the on the grid, traversing the grid, pulling containers out, and then delivering them to the uh, the operators. And as is everything inside of FM8-34, this is meant for class one through four in plastics. It should be self-evident that a top-loading ASRS storage arrangement is unlike any other storage arrangement in need of protection from fire sprinklers. Uh, this is not the only unique challenge presented. As we dig into section 2.4, we will see less of a focus on protection uh, by fire sprinklers and more of, a, of how, we, how do we achieve final extinguishment of a fire. So looking at this, it all goes to how we arrange this storage arrangement. 
The first concern is that we make sure we don't have a dimension that exceeds 100 foot in one direction. And that 100 foot measurement needs to be uh, buffeted by perimeter mezzanines. These mezzanines are actually installed 20 feet in the air. They're able to look over top of the storage arrangement. Uh, how many access points to this mezzanine is, is definitely going to be something that HJ has some input on. We need to provide access through the walls because if, if you remember you saw those images previously the auto store they were surrounded by walls. Well if uh, you have a fire that's all the way at the bottom of these uh, storage containers, how do you get to it? I mean, you can't walk on the grid, you can't climb down, there's no aisles inside of it. So we have to remove wall panels and we have to start pulling the containers out to get to where the fire's at. We also need to make sure that we establish a robot holding area. And that's a place where these robots are going to park in the event of a fire. Uh, as we heard about before through the Okado fire, the robot was the ignition source for the fire. So we don't want the robots to go to a holding area that incorporates uh, combustibles there because that could end up you know, spreading the fire. So these robots need to go to a designated area and that needs to be void of any storage and free of combustibles. If we want to exceed that 100 foot distance, it's possible. Uh, in order to do that though, we're going to have to install elevated mezzanines that have solid floors. It'll allow the fire personnel to get out over top of the storage grid, still keeping that 100 foot distance. With this, we have to make sure that they're 100 foot apart maximum. This is our first look at an elevation view of this, and I just want to point out the uh, the location, the removal walls, the perimeter mezzanines, just, just give you guys a sense of what this looks like. Now, obviously the elevated mezzanines are going to add additional cost to the project, so there would be uh, a desire to eliminate them if possible. FM provides three ways that that's allowed. Option one is installing monitor nozzles at the ceiling and that maximum linear spacing of 100 foot. With this type of monitor nozzle arrangement, there's going to need to be a IR or visible flame detection camera system installed uh, that's monitored at a control room by CCTV. And then that control room also needs to have remote operation capabilities of this. So not an easy type of installation, but one way to avoid elevated mezzanines. Option two is the installation of vertical barriers. And those vertical barriers will be installed from the floor level to the underside of storage using a minimum 20 gauge sheet metal. Those vertical barriers are gonna have to be segregated into 1000 square foot storage areas between the barriers. And we also, could potentially see a fire occur in one of the storage grid columns that's right next to one of our uh, vertical barriers. The heat that's generated from that could be radiated through the 20 gauge sheet metal to the other side. And if there was combustibles there, we could end up having the fire spread to that side of the barrier. For that reason, we got to make sure that we keep one of those containers columns empty. So that's what the yellow is indicating there. We have a, a bit of a fire break next to one of these barriers. Option three has to do with how tall is the building? If the building is 25 foot or less, and we have minimum K14 pendant storage sprinklers located at the top, like our GL14, you can eliminate the need for elevated mezzanines. So there you go, three options to get rid of elevated mezzanines. The robots bring their own challenges. First of all, we want to make sure that they have the least amount of combustible materials used on the exteriors. We know that the Okado fire started because there was plastic located next to the charging ports uh, that happened to ignite. So if we can get rid of that, that makes these robots less of a fire hazard. We know that this, this fire previously happened where the robots were charging. So for that reason, early very early warning fire detection system should be used over top of the charging station. And FM would like to see a process instituted that uh, you end up inspecting the robots after they're charged before sending them into the grid. Hey, 
make sure they're not on fire and send them on their way. Robots are need are in need of being programmed during a fire alarm to get to that designated area. So these are just some of the concerns we have with these robots. I think you guys already probably know it's not possible to install sprinklers anywhere within that grid. So we're gonna have to fully rely on top loading uh, ASRS acceptable ceiling level systems only. We have the ability to put in wet, pre-action, as long as it's installed to wet, and then antifreeze, once again, if it's considered to be greater than 25 degrees. With our ceiling level storage protection, we have a table that we need to look at in this document. It's table 17. And table 17 is going to provide uh, maximum ceiling height and the K factor and the number of sprinklers and the PSI that's required. Fortunately, Reliable has a robust line of storage sprinkler heads that are able to be applied using this table. Um, all, all indications are that this particular storage height of 20 foot is about the max that we're going to see for this type of system. However, there is a table in there for over 20. Like I said, I just don't believe this product exists in the market right now. Everything's pretty much about 19.6 right now for storage height from, uh, I believe, Ocado and Auto Store. Other considerations for this type of system is the need for fixed monitor nozzle protection. FM would like to see this installed in the facility. And with that, again, comes the need for infrared or visible cameras required. Now, they're going to give you three options to skip this whole thing, the monitor nozzles on the, the perimeter, the fixed in place monitor nozzles on the permanent mezzanine level. The first is vertical barriers that are no, no greater than 100 foot maximum dimension. So we'll start subdividing this, this system up here. Uh, 25 foot maximum ceiling height with those K14 sprinklers uh, minimum. And then lastly, the discretion of fire service. If the fire service feels that they don't need the assistance of monitors, that they can bring their own hose lines in there and achieve final extinguishment, they can just say, hey, you can skip them. So you got three options to eliminate these perimeter mezzanine fixed in place monitor nozzles. What's also required throughout the entire area, not just the charging area, is a very early morning fire detection system. So one of our VESDA style systems that's sampling the air. And the main purpose of that is to identify that fire early and get those robots off that holding area, allowing the firefighters and the sprinklers to do their job. And pre-incident planning can't be uh, more important than a facility like this. From the outside, this will look like any other high bay warehouse. From the inside, it'll be completely different. And the fire department needs to understand that. They need to understand what they're getting themselves into before they roll up and try and attack a fire at one of these facilities. I think another thing to keep in mind is that the manufacturers of these top loading ASRS storage arrangements, they understand that their storage offers great efficiencies in storage technology while providing also an equally new and challenging fire protection scenario. What we have just discussed is guidelines that are set forth in a data sheet put out by an insurance provider who's incentivized to minimize risk. Um, should you find yourself working on a project that is lacking in fire protection for this type of stuff, I can't imagine one would, but if you do, uh, I think it's worth consulting with the top loading manufacturers. As an example, Auto Store has run several full-scale fire tests at UL, and they have an idea of how their system is going to interact with fire. So uh, there, there's no shortage of help in this situation, whether it's from FM-834 or possibly the manufacturers of these systems. What does the future hold for 8-34? Well, our next revision uh, that's coming out, it, uh, the, the the word is potentially October, we're gonna see a revision, an interim revision, and uh, we're gonna see possibly 2.2, the rack structure ASRS storage arrangement removed. And possibly the biggest change has to do with what you're looking at right here. This is a solid walled bin that's part of the top loading ASRS storage system that we just discussed in depth. The next edition, is going to offer guidance on non-solid walled 
bins. Why would you want a non-solid walled bin? Well, that is the type of bin that is really beneficial for storing commodities that need to be refrigerated. Uh, so, so having a solid wall doesn't let that cool air get in and really keep the commodity that's perishable uh, at the right temperature. So we need to have this ability to have uh, a non-solid wall bin and how to protect it. What are the impacts of that in fire protection? Well, early indications is that it's not better than what we just talked about. It is potentially worse. And this is all very important and relevant because it goes back to the Okado fire we discussed. The Okado fire was a grocery warehouse. And one of the storage arrangements that was at that warehouse was ambient. The other one was refrigerated and it utilized these non-solid walled bins. So we should expect to see that come out in a future edition, guidance on how to protect that. And like I said, indications are it's going to be worse than what we're seeing with uh, this particular system that we just discussed. Another thing that was mentioned as a possibility is criteria for non-combustible bins. Uh, this is just something that is being put out there for uh, the industry to look at as an alternative because these solid walls and non-solid wall bins that are made out of unexpanded plastic uh, bring their own fire hazards. And if we can get that to a non-combustible bin, maybe that's um, going to be beneficial. So I wanted to take a moment to thank uh, all those companies and individuals that contributed to the presentation without their help with this, it would not have been able to be fully realized in the way that it was. And we hope that you guys learn something from it. As was indicated before, we are available at our technical service phone number and email Monday through Friday. Should you have any questions about what we discussed today, feel free to reach out to us. And now we'll take some questions and answers. Thank you, Brandon. Very nice job. Um, we do have just a couple questions here. Let's uh, let's take the easiest one first. Uh, from a um, uh, uh, from the concept of water coming from above and also some from the side. How is cold solder dealt with um, in the in rack schemes? It's it's one of those things that. Uh, I think the best way to tackle it is to utilize the GL112 with the factory installed shield. Given how closely spaced these tiers are, every inch matters. And having a, uh, a guard and a shield added to the top of that is just going to add extra inches that you may not have to work with in that area. Yeah, and I, I guess I would also add that um, much like the new um, independent rack schemes that are in uh, the 2019 edition of NFPA 13. Um, these sprinklers a lot of times are spaced so closely that the uh, that and the commodity is, is is dense as well that oftentimes the commodity itself prevents the uh, the lateral transfer of water from getting on the adjacent sprinklers. And the theory there also is if water is getting to that sprinkler that potentially cold solder sprinkler really maybe doesn't even need to operate. So um, it, it's a, we don't really worry about it so much is kind of the answer to the question. Um, uh, and that may differ between jurisdictions um, uh, as well. Uh, second question, uh, and this is a long one, but let's see if we can get through it here. Um, we're starting to see what effectively meets the criteria for rack structure ASRS. So your option number two or your scheme number two there. Um, but storing plastic open topped containers, for instance, four, uh, four per rack bay that are placed on rails, not on angle irons. Um, and rather than being pushed back, the boxes are placed by robots running on horizontal tracks from the loading aisle. Um, this is where the question gets a little bit um, uh, confusing. This can result in the creation of a longitudinal comma I'm not sure what the intent was. The question was there. Um, although the rack structure ASRS assumes there is no such flu. And I think you mentioned that in those flow through or those pushback type racks where the pallets essentially butt up against one another and, and you know, force the um, force the 
um, the elimination of that longitudinal flu. Um, the, the questioner says, in this instance, my view is that the longitudinal flu should be protected along the same design criteria as the face sprinklers, i.e. intersections of the longitudinal and transverse flus. Uh, and he's wondering if we have a view on this. A long question. Yeah, no, it is. Um, I, I tend to feel that and I'm not saying that I'm an expert on that, but I tend to feel that the presence of the longitudinal flu is a good thing. And I think that uh, what we're seeing with the automated storage with the, the conveyors and the pallets is that these pallets are butting up against each other, taking away that flu space. Um, so, so potentially having the flu space, I think is probably going to be acceptable assuming that you use the the sprinkler spacing that's prescribed as if it wasn't there yeah and so i would i would also add uh, a little bit to this um yeah, one of the things that you're likely to see coming out uh, of the standards committee in the next uh in the next issues uh 2022 is going to be some uh additional discussion of what constitutes a multiple row rack and there are going to be some uh, constraints placed on the depth of the multiple row rack. And I believe this is probably one reason uh, that this is happening for this for this very scenario that that we're looking at here, the rack structure ASRS. As Brandon noted at the end of the presentation, it's very likely in the next edition of 834 that that's that that rack structure ASRS is going to just basically go out of 834 and the requirements for protecting it are going to become uh, be coming out of 8-9, uh, the other uh, FM data sheet for storage, because uh, as the questioner points out here, these things essentially start looking very much like a multiple row rack, right? They, um, there, there is no longitudinal flu space. Now, think about this as well. If the depth of the pallet load changes, you know, say they're all, you know, you design around four feet, four feet, four feet, and all of a sudden you have a three feet uh, pallet load depth, you you can't have a consistent longitudinal flu space. It just would never exist. So the reality is these things really start walking and talking more like a multiple row rack, and hence the elimination, potential elimination out of 834, doubling back to the requirements of 8-9, and again, some uh, revised language in the, in the upcoming edition of the, uh, NFPA 13 about what constitutes multiple row racks. I think that the, again, long-winded question, long-winded answer, but um, stay tuned uh, for 834 and changes to NFPA 13 uh, as well. 